Hello and welcome to this discussion on family planning and reproductive health with the youth of Uganda who are very passionate about reproductive health and family planning. My name is Patrick Amara. Can I hear applause from the youth of Uganda? Thank you. Those are the youth of Uganda and we are streaming live for the global audience. I welcome you all. Our Twitter handle is hashtag AskHRH. For YP. So you'll be following us and maybe sending your comments and your questions. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce our panelists. Let me begin with our first panelist, ladies and gentlemen. He is the Regional Director for Partners in Population and Development Africa Regional Office. He, is, he was until February 2007 the Director of Uganda's Population Secretariat. He served as Senior Lecturer at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Makerere University Medical School, Uganda. He has also served as a consultant, obstetrician and gynecologist, Mulaga Hospital. Our first panelist is a former president of Uganda Medical Association, as well as a former board member of PPD representing Uganda. He has also served as a board member of Uganda's National Planning Authority, Africa Population and Health Research Center, Kenya, as well as the Population Council of New York. Our first panelist won the 2013 UN Population Award. His main interests have been in population, family planning, reproductive health, as well as HIV AIDS. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the Regional Director for Partners in Population, yes, yes. Dr. Josam Musengozi. <laughs> Our second panelist is the State Minister for Primary Health Care in the Ugandan Cabinet. She was appointed to this position on the 15th of August, 2012. She's also the elected member of Parliament for Tororo District, representing the women she has championed the campaign on teenage pregnancy and is a strong advocate for adolescent sexual reproductive health. Put your hands together for Honorable Sarah Opendi Ocheng. Our third panelist is a physician and public health expert. He became the fourth executive director of UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund. He's also the Under Secretary General of the United Nations. Before this appointment, he was Nigeria's Minister of Health. Prior to that, he was Director General of Nigeria's National Agency for the Control of AIDS, which coordinates HIV and, HIV and AIDS work in a country of more than 160 million people. He's a qualified doctor from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. In 1972, he went to the University of Birmingham, England, where he got a doctorate in medicine in 1979. He was appointed professor at the University of Ibadan in 1980 and headed the Department of Clinical Pathology before being elected provost of the College of Medicine in 1990. Years later, our third panelist served in several organizations, including as a chair of the National Action Committee on AIDS from 2002 to 2007. He received the Nigerian National Honor of Office of the Order of Nigeria in December 2005. He has introduced major reforms to make the UNFPA more focused and results-oriented, as well as intensified efforts to promote the rights and ability of young people to build a better world in the context of sexual and reproductive health. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome with me our third panelist, Dr. Babatunde Osotmehen, UNFPA Executive Director. At, at this juncture, I have two young people of Uganda who are going to make presentations and I ask them to be precise and concise. May I call upon Barbara Uwera to give us your presentation. All Ugandan policymakers and decision makers have been urged to renew their commitment and, acceler and accelerate implementation of the Abuja Declaration that encouraged the increment of 15% towards the national health budgets. And there's also been a need, there's also been, um, there's also been arg arguments so as to strengthen the youth engagement and participation in national health budget planning implementation, performance evaluation including setting aside resources to build the capacity of youth to participate in decision and policy making. There's also been an argument to integrate a skilled best in gender sensitive and, and disability friendly and quality comprehensive and age approximately approximate sexual education for both in and out of school youth. And there's also been a nudge to accelerate the formulation, implementation of national policies towards the need to access health resources and other 
projects so as to make the health a, a youth-friendly environment. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, may I call upon William Yeka. William Yeka, please. Um, greetings from all the young people of Uganda, those around, and those who are actually watching right now. I bring you greetings from the young people of Uganda. Um, some time back last week, we, we young people of Uganda uh, met and we came up with certain challenges that we feel we are facing as far as uh, adoption of safer sexual practices is concerned. And uh, some of these challenges, one, we said, uh, currently, if you look at the health indicators in Uganda, it is very poor. What do I mean? Young people say, it. currently, what is happening is there are a lot of uh, they are increasing cases of HIV prevalence in Uganda, and this is something we see as a challenge, especially if you look at our health. So this is one of the challenges we actually we young people encounter in Uganda. Then secondly, uh, we say the young people actually say it. Um, the second challenge they are facing is um, currently, if you look at the school curriculum for those in school, there is actually limited or inadequate information on matters to do with sexual and reproductive health. So this is the second challenge we, the young people of Uganda, are actually facing. Then thirdly, we again said, we, the young people of Uganda, when we met, we said another challenge we are facing is we are having inaccurate information on matters to do with sexual, on matters to do with sexual and reproductive health. In this case, there are a lot of misconceptions to do with family planning, misconceptions to do with uh, pregnancy. That's why for those who work in areas to do sexual and reproductive health, you find the young people saying that actually when you have sex, the, when you have sex in water or in the river, you're not going to get pregnant. So this is because of what? Inaccurate information. So this is one of the challenges we, the young people of Uganda, are actually facing. Then another challenge we, we the young people of Uganda, are facing is uh, uh, there's a lot of unemployment, and that is something I don't need to explain because everyone knows what is happening in Uganda. So because of that, we're actually unable to have access to sexual and productive health services because... It's to do with family planning. I mean, we want to buy pills, we can't afford them. And we're saying that this is a big challenge. That is why, actually, when you talk about sexual and reproductive health, these are things we may not afford, and sometimes those who afford actually don't have adequately, adequate facilities on matters to do with their sexuality. Then finally, another thing we're facing is we said um, we actually don't have adequate uh, sexual, uh, sexual and reproductive health services. When you go to this uh, family plan, when you go to health centers, hospitals, um, we don't have family planning clinics. Those which are there are actually not operational. I think those who have ever gone to health centers or who work in the line of health know what is happening. So that is a big challenge we are facing. That's why we felt that we have to put them forward so that the policymakers can help us address some of those challenges in order to have a very good health. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara and William. Uh, we've, you've made your points. Your points have been heard. Now let me turn to the panelists. I'm going to begin with Dr. Josem to respond to the issues that have come from Barbara and William. Josem. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. And I'm very excited to be here to engage you young people. Some of you, I saw you a couple of days ago when you were doing your uh, pre-youth pre conference. And uh, uh, I was excited to participate in that. I think today is a turning point for the youth in Uganda, and uh, you heard the, what the president said uh, about young people in the context of a demographic dividend. We'd like to make sure that indeed, as you have heard, uh, I think the chairman of the National Planning Authority made the point to the president, to the audience, to the ministers of health, the executive director of UNFPA, that people do not have access to quality reproductive health care, they don't have access to family planning, supplies, um, a lot of people out there in the rural areas, uh, including young people, they would like to have a choice, uh, but when they go to services, and I think the first presenter has just said it, you find that the, the, the choices are not there, or sometimes the, the method that you are using is not there. And so what are we saying? We are saying the government must take responsibility to provide an enabling environment so that the key players, uh, should they be its government, public sector, should it be the private sector, should it be civil society, they are able to make sure that young people have quality, reproductive health services, they have access to family planning, because this matters for them. If they get pregnant when they haven't planned for it, they miss out on their education, and therefore at that point in time, you can see where they end up. It's not only that they themselves are condemned to poverty, but you also know if they, their own children, their own families 
uh, they are not going to prosper. So this is a very important message and I'm very glad that the policy makers in Uganda today have been able to zero down on this even at the head of state level. And, and I think we should make the point, I think uh, Dr. Batunde, wherever you go, I think the issue of articulating these issues to the leaders that have responsibility in those countries, because uh, you are at the global level, uh, the minister is here, but if the president says this is what we are going to do, this is what I'm committed to do, I'm going to increase funding for this, then that way we can hold them accountable, and, and in, indeed they should be accountable to you because you vote for them and they have a responsibility to you. So I'm very, very glad today that we have had this message, and I hope that your resolutions that you passed will continue to resonate very well in the conference, and I really want to appeal to you to continue making the necessary noise so that you get the services you deserve. Give me a round of applause. Thank you very much, Dr. Joseph Musinguzi. Let me now turn to Honorable Saro Pendi because the issues William and Barbara raised are concerning governance and leadership and then maybe they need executive decision. Honorable Sara. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here speaking to the youth and especially at the time when we have just launched the campaign against teenage pregnancy. Uh, this is the very first time that we were having a national family planning conference in this country. And to us, this is a big, big achievement in the health sector. And this definitely is the beginning of our campaign to end the teenage pregnancies, our campaign to increase um, access to family planning, and our campaign to ensure that every child born in this country is not born by chance but born by choice. Uh, as you all heard, the youths in this country, you have met and you have raised various challenges. True, there has been inadequate information that is provided to the youth and this is basically because we have not had adequate youth-friendly services at the health centers. Government has done its best to ensure that we have health facilities at the parish level, we have health facilities at the sub-county level, and of course, we have also ensured that we have staff who are employed to attend to the mothers and all those who may go to seek for services, especially services regarding family planning. Unfortunately, as indicated, true, we have not been able to create the youth-friendly services that we have all been talking about. Last year, we did commit, as the Ministry of Health, to have these services available because we do realize that the youths feel more comfortable to go to a place where they will find other youths other than going to a facility where they will find their mothers and they are all seeking for the same service. So government is committed providing uh, these services at the uh, facility level. We have all committed ourselves to find uh, a corner for the youths at the health facilities. But of course, we cannot do it all at a go, but we are committed to this. And of course, um, contraceptives are available. The government has increased funding. As you have all heard, the president made a commitment in the London summit in 2012 to increase uh, contraceptives, to increase funding, to ensure the commodities are available, and this has been done. We have now increased funding to a tune of, I think, 6.9 million US dollars currently, just to ensure that we have the family planning commodities. And the good news that I want to give to the youths, these contraceptives are available, free of charge. So. Those who, uh, contrary to what was indicated, that uh, you cannot afford because you are unemployed, please, the contraceptives are available at the health facilities and they are given free of charge. So please take note of this. And of course, the whole purpose of this family planning conference today is to scale up uh, the family planning services, scale up the use of contraceptives in this country so that we can have healthy mothers, and also, most importantly, have healthy children in the country. You, as the youths, 
are of course the future leaders of tomorrow. Statistics actually indicate that most of the youths in this country start sex as early as 14 years, 13 years, which is extremely dangerous. And most of it is sometimes even unprotected. You end up contracting HIV AIDS, but also the danger of getting pregnant when you're still young. And of course, it comes with other challenges, like challenges of fistula, uh, challenges of obstructed labor, which results into death. And of course, even disability in some instances. So our appeal to the young people who are here seated and those who are listening to us, please have protected sex. Most importantly, ensure that you do not have sex and end up getting pregnant and also end up going into abortions, which are also claiming most of the young people in this country. So with those, I think for now, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. <laughs> Honorable Saro Pendi, we have heard from the civil society. We have also heard from those who take decision for our country in the area of health. Let us hear from, uh, the, uh, from the, the world perspective from Dr. Babatunde responding to Barbara and William's question, uh, questions and comments. Dr. Babatunde. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Madrito. Uh, let me also thank William and Barbara for giving us uh, feedback of the conversations you have had. Um, and I want to say that uh, these are conversations that I'm very familiar with because I've been to many of these meetings and I've had this kind of feedback. Uh, and I want to congratulate the government of Uganda for the positions they have taken and the progress that has been made in the last uh, two, three years in this country. So we are at a cost uh, in this country to go forward and do something really dramatic. Now, and you are the people who can do it. Because, uh, as the minister have said, yes, we can create spaces, yes. We can also create youth-friendly centers. But utilization of those centers, the information about those centers, the ability for you to be able to talk to yourselves, to be able to uh, persuade yourselves that this is the right thing to do. You must know that the number of young girls who die from unsafe abortion is what is creating the high maternal mortality figures that we have. And so we need to find a way to get you to be a little more aggressive about how you access information and services. If you leave it all to government, um, we're not going to go too far. You are the most connected generation the world has ever known. Each one of you has a cell phone. And you talk to yourselves. I've never seen, well, don't let me say I've never seen. I've experienced in my life uh, Generations of young people. This one is one that is, I think, obsession is the word to information and to talking. You know, a friend of mine who, <clears throat> who was running Coca-Cola in West Africa came one day and told me, he said, you know, we are, we are not making as much sales as we used to make. I said, What's the problem? So young people prefer to buy airtime <laughs> than drink Coke. And that's the truth. I mean, I have four daughters, and the only thing they spend their money on is airtime. And they just keep going. And sometimes you ask, you've been on the phone for one hour. What are you talking about? Say, yeah, Daddy, you won't understand. <laughs> the point I'm making is that I'm challenging you 
to actually take the technologies that is at your disposal to do two things. First, the comprehensive sexuality education you are talking about. It is available. We can provide you with elements of it. And you can, amongst yourselves, just a network, every Friday morning, send a message to yourselves about what it is about comprehensive sexuality education. So the kind of taboo that uh, the moderator talked about, that you cannot get pregnant if you have sex uh, in the water. I've had this before. In fact, somebody told me that, a lady told me, a young lady told me that you can't have, you cannot get pregnant if you have sex standing up. <laughs> there, there are many of these myths going around. But if we are able to create uh, uh, some kind of information uh, network amongst you, which we can help you to do, to pass information about comprehensive sexuality education. First, that gives you power because it gives you information and knowledge. The second is that I also think that you must help government in identifying where services can be located. See, when we talk about youth-friendly services, it doesn't have to be a, 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 a super-duper kind of construction. All you need is a place where young people can meet, talk to themselves, exchange views, exchange views honestly, and exchange views about what is happening to themselves. And then, of course, you can install some things there, modern technology that enables people to call in to find out, uh, you know, I just missed my period three months, two, uh, I missed my period two weeks ago, what do I do? How, how do I go about it? Is, am I pregnant? Uh, you know, those kinds of things. Many times, you know, <clears throat> a lot of young people just want counseling and information. And that gives them the power to take decisions different from the decisions they would normally take. Uh, and I, and I, I want us to uh, creatively go forward doing this. So sharing information, making sure we can also, within your own powers, begin to create this youth constructs that, that enables you to access services. UNFPA will work with you and government to ensure that we can do that. And, and I think that that's where we should go. Uh, many of you will not be able to go to hospital. Many of you will not be able to go to health centers. But if it is uh, if it's William that is there, you will go because you can talk to him. You know, if it's Barbara that is there, you will go because you can talk to her. And I think that's what we need to create because that's the solution that we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Obatunde has said correctly, we are, you are the most connected generation he's seen. And you're always sharing information on your Twitter, on, on Facebook, and everywhere. What are you talking about? What are you sharing? Now, this is your opportunity to give a question or your comment. Please make it precise and concise. And for our global audience, you can send our, uh, our hashtag is AskSRH4YP, so that your question too can be read here and you'll be answered. So let me take the first three questions from you, and please argue to be precise and concise. I'm going to begin with a gentleman in a black suit and a lady at the back, and then a gentleman seated here. Uh, somebody to give them a microphone very fast. To tell us who, your name, where you're from, and then keep it very short. Very Thank you. Uh, my name is Kavili Ali. I'm a youth activist, and I work with the uh, Forum for Women Democracy Young Leaders Alumni Association as the president and also work with the Uganda Youth Network as a program assistant within the youth policy advocacy component. Uh, my question is about youth inclusion and participation, especially in decision-making spaces. Much as we are discussing more about you know, how young people can access information on sexual and reproductive 
health services, you realize that when it comes to decision-making spaces, when it comes to policy formulation, young people are not always involved in these uh, decision-making spaces and policy formulation for that matter. <coughs> My question is, how can young people be invested in so that they can meaningfully engage uh, within the policy design, policy impl uh, implementation uh, platforms, as well as uh, monitoring and evaluation of these programs. Thank you, Ali. You have made your point. Whom are you asking that question? I just pose it to the okay, entire Okay, thank panel. you very much. And the lady at the back, if you can also okay. be precise. Okay. Thank concise. you very much, sir. I just have two your questions. Your name and where you are from? What My name is Barbara Kemigisa. Okay. I'm an HIV AIDS activist. Uh, I'd like to ask the Honorable, first of all, yes, the government has promised us the youth-friendly services. Ever since 2009, when I tested HIV positive and I was pregnant by then, I did not get the friendly services. Since then, I've been hearing of the same thing, unfriendly services. My question is, when are these services going to be given to us? Because people have been promising they never give us the when factor. As activists, we are going to keep on telling you we are tired of bad services. I don't know if you're going to be able to handle us for all Thank that you. time. Thank you. Can the second so question is... One, we are about 30 people. Everybody is going to ask a question. May I ask at the moment you take one question. Okay. If you have a chance, we'll come back to you. Thank you, Kemi Gisa. Give a round of applause. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kazuwe Michael, working as a youth coordinator, Chisugu Health Center. Uh, my question specifically goes to Dr. Babatunde. He's talked about uh, the current form of information giving, and it's like every youth is able to get information. But now maybe this could be something for the people around town. Now, how are we going to pass on this information to the rural areas because I believe that I've worked in community and I've seen so many young people suffering because they haven't gotten or the information has been not disseminated to them, yet they are the most vulnerable groups of people. Thank you very much. This information thing could be just a town issue and yet in the villages in Kaveramaido and Karamoja and outside Uganda, perhaps information is not being shared like it is here. Uh, let me begin maybe with Dr. Babatunde because the last question came to you. Thank you very much. I, I think that you underestimate the power of the cell phone because I, I, I don't think it's, a, it's an urban phenomenon alone. People carry cell phones everywhere in Africa now. And I think you, when we talk about passing information, we're talking of we're not talking of smartphone information. We're talking of information that you can actually send on a text message. Now, that's the first. The second, of course, is that I know in Uganda, like in every African country, that we do have ways of passing information to ourselves. It might be a little drama. It might be a song. It might be a radio announcement of some sort. It might be a radio drama that actually puts it across. I think you have to contextualize this within the framework of Uganda. Uh, and, and in a sustainable way, many times we start this, we don't, we don't push it far. And I think we need to push it far because that is what is going to make sure that people get the right information. But Information without service is not good. If you give information and there is nowhere to go, then there's a problem. So I would suggest that we, con we try you know, to identify places where young people can go to, in, even in the most rural place, so you can actually get the service that you need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the second question, maybe I push it to Dr. Jotham, uh, especially on stigma, and then uh, Ali's question will go to the Honorable Minister, Sarah. Dr. Jotham. Well, uh, I think uh, Barbara was asking, I think she asked the minister who should uh, be able to speak about that, because I think it was very, very specific. Uh, so if you don't mind, let me talk about uh, inclusion of young people, the one which came from the Uganda Youth Network. 
And uh, I, I hear you, I hear what you are saying, and, and I think there has been uh, a lot of frustration uh, from the young people in terms of how they can be mean, meaningfully involved in the policy formulation and, uh, and decision making. <laughs> and, uh, but I also think that uh, there have been opportunities. For example, if you look at uh, what is happening in this country, you as young people, you have your own elected members of parliament. They, are, they speak for you in the parliament. But I think what you could also do is really to ask them to help you in things that concern you on day to day. Because I know when you elect members of parliament, they go there, they are going to go and speak, uh, to, they are speaking to the speaker, to the president, in their caucuses. And I think they tend to let you, you down in terms of looking at your real needs, everyday needs. For example, your, your own education. What is it that is bothering? Education, UP is there universal primary education. But uh, how come that uh, a lot of young girls are dropping out and nobody seems to be picking this up? This country established the UPE in, 19, in 1997. But we also know, recent studies have shown that only about 23% of, of, the, of the girls eventually complete primary. What has happened to all the rest along the line? These are questions that you need to ask your own leaders whom you have elected to be able to get involved in so that you get answers to these questions. And, and I think you should not underrate your own power because with education, and Baba Tunde keeps talking about the cell phone, this, these are powerful instruments, powerful tools that you can use. Uh, young people of your age, uh, when I was growing up, we didn't have these type of advantages. But we still had these questions. We know we are not being involved in terms of decision making. And so the time is now. You are more knowledgeable, you have more communication, you have better networks, and I think you should work those networks, you should use your elected people to make sure that you are received at the table and you make your points very clearly. And I know you also have knowledge about what works. The research is there, evidence is available. And uh, I was also at your uh, previous uh, conference a few days ago, and I heard your resolutions. And your resolutions are real concrete, Honorable Minister, uh, these young people took resolutions which if you bring in this conference and you take them forward, you follow them up, you are going to make a difference in the programs that yes. are yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Sarah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, allow me to add my voice to uh, Dr. Musinguzi's the inclusion of youths. There is no policy that can be made in this country without consulting the key stakeholders. All policies that have been made, government has endeavored to consult all the key stakeholders. So what concerns youths? There is always consultation. Some of you may not know, not all of you can be uh, invited, but some of your leaders are always engaged to make a contribution to whatever policies that we have in this country. Um, so we have been engaging you through your leaders, through some of the organizations that do exist, that promote youth services and youth activities in this country. Um, on matters of HIV AIDS, I believe, of course, with support from partners, we have attended various uh, meetings not only in this country, but even abroad. I've been meeting some of you, even the family planning conference that we had in Addis Ababa, a good number of youths were sponsored from this country to go and attend and also um, make their contributions. So um, we have been engaging the youths as government. Um, my young sister who said since 2009, we have been promising uh, or talking about establishing youth-friendly services, and nothing has come up. I strongly, um, well, I don't want to say that uh, we have been providing lip, lip service, but since I joined the ministry, one of my core activities is to ensure that we have these youth-friendly services established. And we actually have these services available in the universities, although um, I may not have 
the concrete information here, but I am aware that at the university level, working with our health implementing partners, for example, Productive Health Uganda, they have people whom they have identified who provide key information to the youths that may need information regarding the sexual and reproductive health services. We have also, of course, within Kampala, we have uh, services available at Naguru for the youths, where the youths have been going and receiving whatever information they, they want, whatever services they, 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 they need. So these services have not been scaled up throughout the country, but I'm aware that they are available in particular areas in the country, and we pledged, and I want to pledge as the Minister of State for primary health care that this will be achieved. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to take another set Can of I questions. Can I just conclude? Yes, we had Honorable. challenges with staff. We had challenges initially with staffing. But of course, this is an issue that government has now resolved. Thank so you. we have staff that will be available in the different parts of this country to attend the youths. Honorable Sarah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take three questions, but also maybe the people who are following us, uh, streaming this live, maybe they'll need to know. There's always a problem, Honorable Minister, in uh, narrowing the gap between the knowing and doing. It appears this country knows what to do, but they never practice or never put in action. So when are you going to narrow that gap? And, and, and when you talk about Makerere, that's a very tiny fraction of the Ugandan population. Now, guru for three million Kampalans, it's just a tiny fraction. I'm going to take uh, uh, Barbara, you, a lady there, and a gentleman here, <laughs> and, uh, and another, lady, another lady in blue skirt. Yes, your name, where you're from, and make it very my precise. Name, my name is Natasha Emily Nake. Um, I work with Open Mic Uganda. I'm a writer. And my question is, what alternative solutions have you come up with to achieve the same objectives of family planning other than direct uh, methods? that you are coming up with, like using uh, injections and uh, the different family planning methods. For example, uh, women produce for the nation. What has the government done to empower these women? Uh, for example, give them free delivery in hospitals and uh, free amenities like free transport or salaries that a woman has given birth, let's give them such a payment from the government. What other alternatives have you come up with? Thank you. Melina wants to know the alternatives. You know, check, many of us check. are giving birth by chance and not by <laughs> choice or sometimes by accident. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, uh, hey, are we all awake? Bonfire? bonfire. I can't feel you young people. What's a bonfire? bonfire? Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ugly MC and my other name is Abbas Hassan Muhammad Ibrahim Amin. Uh, creative director of Bonfire Uganda that uses uh, arts and culture for positive social uh, uh, change and development. Now, my question actually is to uh, our mama minister and also to uh, also our grandfathers who are around. Now, uh, yeah, it's good to respect people. Now, one thing that I want to ask is this as a young person, because my biggest fear, there are two things that we keep forgetting. There is a very big war that is brewing much as they, they come to you guys and stake hold and sit in those small kamukunji, the meetings, and then the policies are made, that is, these two people, actually they are the biggest, biggest people who are against the whole policy, the family planning policy and all that. That's religion and culture. Because for me as a Muslim, in my religion, it's still said it is not there. Coming to my culture, it is not supposed to be there because they want children, they want this in religion, you're not supposed to use this. So I really don't know, uh, Mama Minister, and also uh, the elders, how Thank you guys are going to have that engagement. Thank you. Religion and culture. In fact, for those who are there at the opening of this conference, a Sheikh refused to pray because this was against the culture. He went to the podium and said, no, Mr. President, I'm not going to pray today because this is against us. So yes, I mean, I agree with you. It is in a religion and it was today more than exposed. <laughs> today it was given audience at the national platform. Barbara. No, 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 no not you, Barbara. Did somebody give you a microphone? Sorry. Uh, maybe I'll take four so you can continue with your question. I'll take four questions. So please. Thank you. I'm Barbara Wera, a volunteer with RHU. RHU. Um, 
We've realized that our biggest problem is implementation of these policies. Fine, they've been formulated, but it is all around implementing them. We have talked, we've talked, and we are still talking. But my question is, are they going to be implemented? Is someone going to act instead of just listening to our questions? If it means financial Im implications, then because this change starts with us, then we are willing to go that extra mile to make sure these policies are implemented. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have questions that have been coming on our Twitter handle. Uh, let me ask somebody to, to read those questions so that we can also uh, include our global audience. And then I'll take the other fourth question, is which is coming from the audience. Yes, you have the questions. OK, thank you very much, Patrick. Most of the questions are quite uh, similar to the ones we are discussing here. But there's one particular question from uh, Omar Weswala that's specifically going to the executive director. And he's asking, what is your assessment of Uganda's performance in addressing SRH issues uh, compared to other countries in the world? So I think uh, we can continue to take some of the questions as we screen, okay. and then we'll get that back That was to going you. specific to the executive director, UNFPA. Let me take the fourth question that was a lady in pink or purple. What, you had your arm up. You don't want to speak now? All right. OK. All right. Hello? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Patrick Mwesiji. I work with the Uganda Youth and Adolescent Health Forum. And I'd like uh, to, my question to go straight to the Honorable Minister. And I'm quoting right from the Adolescent Health Policy Standard Service Guidelines that uh, were designed in May 2011 that still provide for provision of youth-friendly services right from lower health facilities, health center twos, threes, fours, district hospitals, regional referrals, and the referral, national referral, uh, whereby, yes, government has committed. Right now, you have committed to provide, you have committed to provide youth-friendly services. But for the last many, many, many years, we've not seen a financial commitment in the health sector budget to actually uh, uh, establish and operationalize or functionalize youth-friendly services at our public health facilities. So would like you to, to assure the young people uh, across, the, across the country, especially with their representatives who are here, that in next year's budget, especially the budget for 2014-2015, that there will be a budget line for adolescent health, and then we shall surely guarantee our government votes, or else it will be a problem. Yes, because it has been a provision, it has been a commitment for a very, very, very long time. So we want to hold you accountable. And we know that for you to be able to provide these services, there must be a budget line. And so just assure us that we're going to have a budget line for adolescent health, specifically for establishing youth health centers at public health facilities, and also making them functional by providing health workers that can provide youth Thank you, services. Patrick. You've been yes. super focused on that point, yeah, and sure. I think the ministers had. So let us begin with her, because she had most of the questions directed towards <laughs> you, Honorable Minister, your, your response. Okay. Um, the issue of the religious and cultural leaders and how we are going to engage them. I think today's family planning conference was exactly meant to do that. We did invite the religious leaders, we did invite the cultural leaders because we believe they are key in helping us move this agenda forward. And of course, you saw that in the audience, we had representation from various cultural institutions. Um, the, the king of Bunyoro was present, the king, uh, the cultural leader from um, Tororo for the Adola was present, and others were represented by the, either the prime minister or respective uh, ministers. So the whole purpose of this conference is to re-engage all the stakeholders in this country. And for us, we believe that we have started the engagement. And we want to really appreciate, because when the president made the remarks, I think he was spot on and asked everybody, the religious leaders, to join hands and embrace family planning. We are not talking about producing few children like the president said. 
we are talking about having a number of children that you can support as a young family and of course this is where the misconception is what is the point of having so many children that you cannot feed that you cannot educate that you cannot even provide for basic items that they need in a home the young girl from Nabi, from gayaza i think some detail you all heard what she said i don't need to repeat it here so this the purpose of this conference and as i did indicate this is the very first time that uganda as a country is hosting this family planning conference to re-engage the leaders to make them appreciate the reason for family planning and to make everybody appreciate why we should have a population that is healthy and a population that is productive so for us i think we have almost achieved what we want we're going to continue engaging them so that we can be able to move forward this conference is for three days we expect to still be talking to the religious leaders of course some of them may not be here but we believe their representatives will be here and on wednesday that is where the key statements will be made by all the various stakeholders the religious leaders we hope will be able to make a statement the cultural leaders will make a statement the political leaders and all the others um, Barbara did indicate, are we going to act? We are talking, talking, talking. I think we have started acting. Yeah. We have started acting. If I give you statistics, before the NRM government came to power, just 3% of the population was using contraceptives in this country. 3%. Today, at least we have moved that to 30%. Isn't that an achievement? And now we are committed to move this even further. And we want the unmet need in this country, which currently stands at 34%, to drop to zero. So that every woman, every young woman, the youths inclusive, that needs contraceptives should be able to access them. We are talking of full access and full choice. So we have started acting, we have started implementing, and I strongly believe with support from my colleagues, because this is really my responsibility. I'm going to champion this with the support of my colleagues to ensure that we stop the lip service, but act. So please, youths, I will only appeal to you. The contraceptives are available, information is available. For those who are in Kampala, we have even a youth desk at the Ministry of Health that can provide you with information. We even have toll-free lines that are available that you can call and also get information and expert advice. So um, we are moving in the right direction. Um, budget line? I think. The budget line, Honorable Minister. For the budget line, the 2014-15 budget is already drawn. And I want to assure you it is holistic. It covers the youths, it covers the mothers, it covers the children and the adults. Government, it's our responsibility as government to provide health care to everybody that needs it and also provide family planning services to you. As I did indicate earlier, the president did commit to increase the budget to family planning services in this, in this country by 5 million US dollars annually, and this has been achieved. So, to me, I may not, for now, tell you that we shall have this specific line in the budget, because the budget has already been made. But as I did indicate earlier, this budget covers everything. We know the challenges that we are facing. One of the challenges why we are not being, having why most of the mothers and the young people out there were not accessing service, family planning services is because of lack of staff at the lower health facilities. As I did indicate earlier, we have increased. Originally, from the assessment, we needed close to 10,231 health workers in this country. We, in the last financial year, managed to recruit 7,000 
200. We have pledged to close the gap by recruiting an additional 3,000 health workers this financial year. And of course, the whole idea is to make uh, the health centers that exist at the sub-counties which are in the rural areas functional, and one of which is to ensure that we have a midwife or a health worker dedicated to offering family planning services Thank to the you. mothers that need them. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you. Uh, we will going to hear the response from Dr. Josam and, and Dr. Babatunde. And after that, we are engaging to another uh, discussion. We will ask journalists who have international and uh, Ugandan journalists here. You have an opportunity to ask questions. You have six minutes. You're going to use only six minutes and, and ask your question. Go for it, and then you get the response from them. Can I hear from Dr. Josam? Uh, I'll give a, a, a quick one on regarding uh, religion and culture. And I think the Honourable Minister has really uh, addressed this. She, she has spoken to it very effectively. But also, as young people, to let you know, as you uh, continue on your, on your path, uh, we we'll have to deal with culture and, uh, and religion. These are power centers. They are not about to go away, and so we must prepare ourselves. We must be knowledgeable enough to know where they are coming from and where they are going, and but also for us to be able to be knowledgeable enough. There are, there are issues out there that uh, you'll find conflict with your own personal interests, the indiv individual's interests. But when we are empowered with information, we can always be able to deal with them. Uh, you may hear that uh, maybe some religions, the Catholic Church, for example, Sometimes it's not always supportive of uh, uh, contraceptives, especially what they call artificial. They would rather go for the natural one. And, and I think they should be encouraged to continue supporting the natural one as they wish. But also we need to be able to put up arguments and show them why uh, indeed maybe artificial uh, family planning is more effective. And uh, if people have medical conditions, uh, it is uh, more important, it's better for them to use this type of method rather than relying on, on natural family planning. But also to know that uh, some of you who are knowledgeable enough, you know, if you visited uh, uh, Italy and you went to Rome where the, His Holiness st sits, in his backyard people use family planning. 70% of people in Italy, they use family planning. It's not that they are not listening to His Holiness the Pope, they do, but they also decide to do what is good, really good for them depending upon their situation. So, uh, I think I would like to encourage you that uh, religion and culture can be uh, a stumbling block, but if we are armed with information and we also tell people, they will do the right thing, and I think that should be the way. Thank you but very culture much. Culture and religion are going to be here for some time. There's a, a question that Evelyn read from, I think, from the Twitter, and uh, it was directed to Dr. Babatunde. If you had to give Uganda marks, would you be generous or not? <laughs> well... In the line of business I'm in, I don't give marks to countries. <laughs> but I can, say, I can say one thing, that since 2012, when I first visited Uganda, in my current position as Executive Director of UNFPA, I've seen a sea change in the issues of family planning. We have the President of the Republic, who has taken leadership on this matter. We have government that has put more resources to it. We have a Ministry of Health that actually is doing some wonderful work on the ground. We have partners on the ground who are motivated to try and assist government. Now, the issues of family planning in Uganda is similar to the issues of fund planning in many parts of Africa. But I can tell you this much. To have a contraceptive prevalence rate of 30% is substantial because there are many countries in Africa that actually have 10%, 5%, 6%. So Uganda has moved on. There's a lot to do, much more than we had before. But I believe that with a population as vibrant as this, and you as young people, who actually should be the target of services, uh, we can make things happen quickly. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, um, well, time is against us. At this juncture, may I uh, have um, journalists, local and international journalists, who will take each one of them one question. And No, no, one question, because time is against us. I make it clear. Um, okay. Your um, media house and where you're from? Dicta Simwe, the East African newspaper. The yes. minister talked about uh, $6.9 million, million. I think by now we should have moved. Uganda made a commitment in London to increase by $5 million annually, or am I wrong? What happened? Thank you, Thank Victor. You. Um, another question? Yes. Um, Caroline Ariba, New Vision. Uh, the question comes to, uh, I think, all of you. It's on teenage pregnancies. And I think the biggest challenge has been uh, us pretending that sex is not happening among us, our teenagers. So how do we um, talk about sex in a way that doesn't, again, lure those that are not, talking, that are not having sex? That is the question. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Children producing children in Uganda, that's very common. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Emmanuel from the Daily Monitor. I'm passionate about health reporting, and I'm going to say this from an experience I got. Uh, when I traveled to my home district, Kabari, I found a lady who had, had less, uh, left pregnant with a second child in a space of uh, two, two years. So I wondered, uh, isn't family planning here? So uh, I'm trying to say this. Why is there a disparity between the urban elite and the rural communities. And there is led, one lady who wrote in, the, in the, one of the dailies that as the, the urban are adhering to family planning, uh, the rural-based uh, citizens are not adhering to family planning. Are and, compensating for them, in other words. Yeah, and, uh, and who, who, will, who will be there when the piece of the urban who are rich uh, uh, are attacking those ones who have not produced and have the means. Thank you. So uh, we want a directed sense of family planning. Thank you. Um, th there's two questions here, and that will be it. And uh, our panelists will respond to them. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dennis Kato. I work with CBS Radio. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sarah Pendi, I realized one, one problem here. Uh, when it comes to our friends, brothers and sisters that are disabled in one way or the other, our brother over there has a problem. He cannot speak. And we see it that uh, the government is trying to ensure that family planning services are delivered to all persons, or to all Ugandans. What strategies have the government put in place to ensure that all brothers and sisters that are disabled get their health services, specifically re in regards to uh, family planning. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you very much. Um, and the last one here. Please make it very precise. Uh, one question. Uh, pr precisely. Mine goes to the State Minister for Health. My name is Raymond. I work with Uganda Radio Network. Uh, Honorable Minister, you said uh, as part of your projections, you plan to increase more health workers. Now, um, take a close look at the Ministry of Finance allocations to you the wage budget is going to remain constant even in the projections for the next year, the next financial, which is 2016, 2017. So what magic, what Hail Marys are we going to say in between now and then that this money comes through for health workers? Thank you very much. Yes, oh, dear panelists, you've had the journalists, the scribes uh, speak and they have asked questions. It's your time to respond to them. I'll begin with you, Honorable Minister. You had Thank so many you. questions. Um, I'll begin with the last question. I don't know which budget you're looking at, because as you know that uh, most of the health workers that we actually have at the health facilities, especially the lower health facilities, the district, the local, the health center four, health center three, and health center two, are not under the Ministry of Health budget. The money is actually put to the districts. It's budgeted for under the various district local governments. So uh, do not look at the Ministry of Health budget line and then think that is meant for the health workers at the district level. That's the clarification that I wanted to make on that. Um, 
For the sign language, the point is noted. Uh, I think that is one area that we still have a bit of a challenge, but we're going to ensure that, um, because it's government policy, to ensure that um, uh, everybody in this country actually accesses services. And of course, we must be able to communicate with even those who cannot speak. Um, the other was on the disparity between the urban elite and the rural. Of course, in the urban areas, people are elite educated. That is where the challenge is, and that's why we are talking about educating the girl child. Because we believe that once people, once a girl child is educated, she will be able to make a decision on how many children she wants to have. She will be able to understand the advantages of family planning. But when you have girls who are not educated, that's where the challenge comes in. But of course, as you are aware, government has the UPE program, the USC program, and of course now the University Students Loan Scheme, which is aimed at helping those people in the rural areas who cannot afford uh, to go to the other schools that some of us go to, to actually access education. But also, most importantly, we have the village health teams that are supposed to be based at the village level. We've had a bit of a challenge with the VHTs because ideally we are supposed to have five, VH, five VHTs per village. And of recent, the VHTs who have been doing a good job because most of them have been given information. They actually help at the village level with passing all vital health information to the people at the village level. Uh, of course, the key challenge now is they are doing a good job and they've been asking to be at least motivated with something. We have been giving them bicycles to help. We have provided bicycles actually to all VHTs across the country to help them move from one home to another uh, with support from partners. Of course, they have also got some t-shirts so that they can be identified. And of course, I just want to inform you that government is now trying to review the VHT strategy so that we can have a stronger and well-motivated VHT to move to the various households, reach out to the various mothers and the young men in this country to provide uh, health information. So we note the disparity, but we believe that um, from the Ethiopian model, where they have used the community health workers, and they have done a very good job in turning around uh, the tide, of course, regarding the maternal and child health. We believe that we are going to uh, use the Ethiopian model to improve on the VHT in this country. And already, uh, we already have a draft which we are going to discuss. So very soon, we hope that once we review the VHT, we shall be able to see even the people at the village level accessing vital health information and vital health care services. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Josam. Uh, just as a comment uh, uh, from uh, New Vision, uh, the letter from New Vision uh, on teenage pregnancies, I think you as young people, and I think this has been said before, the minister has just ended on it, information is power for you. And uh, we also know that education, uh, getting uh, uh, comprehensive sexual education, doesn't really lead to irresponsible behavior by young people, not at all. If anything, it is actually the opposite. So we'd like to encourage you to get as much information as possible, get uh, information about uh, your own physiology, your own bodies, so that you are able to take those responsible decisions, protect yourself first and foremost, use your networks uh, to be able to get information, uh, ask your friends through those particular networks uh, what works and what doesn't work, and then, then you are able to protect yourself. You get educated, you keep in schools, you get good education, you get jobs and you are going to prosper. And what is good for you as an individual is eventually going to translate into the next generation, but also the country is going to take advantage of, of that, of uh, be, you being healthy, educated and skilled. And I think this is the way we are also going to grow our economy in the country. So you as young people, you need to use the information and the education and the services that are provided. Take advantage of them so that you are able to be an asset 
for you. your own country. Thank you, Dr. Jossom. Uh, Dr. Babatunde. Uh, no question was directed to me, actually. But let me, let me comment on two things. The issue of teenage pregnancy is one that is actually global. Um, it's, it's Africa, it's Asia, it's also Latin America. And one of the things we find is the disparity between the, the desire of society to reduce teenage pregnancy but not wanting to do what is required for it to go. So when we talk about teenage pregnancy and we confront society by saying, you know, in order to make it happen, you have to provide age-appropriate sexuality education. You also have to provide services for young people. They don't want to hear that. You see, you cannot have it both ways. You either want to reduce it by doing the right thing, or you don't. So what I would say is that as young people, you must advocate and insist that two things, one, age-appropriate sexuality education, access to services, because that's what is going to take it away. The second point I wanted to make, and it is gone, uh, the gentleman there. When we talk about culture and religion, you see, I think culture and religion should never be, uh, should never be an obstacle to progress in a society. There is no society that I know, there is no culture that I know that condones the death of its young people. And I think we must confront people by saying that. We cannot wait and we cannot accept that because of some cultural belief, young people should die when they should not, uh, when, when you know, bearing children when they are not supposed to bear children. And I'll give you two clear examples. Um, Iran has the best population policy in the world. It's a very, very, very uh, Islamic country. Tunisia has a very, very good population policy. It is a Muslim country. Brazil, which is the largest Catholic country in the world, has gone through demographic transition and has a very good population policy. So don't let anybody use religion or culture to bamboozle all of us. Decisions are taken by you for your own good, and you must insist that survival, dignity of yourself, and your ability to be who you are must reign supreme. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, th I thank you, the audience here, but I also thank you, our global audience that have been uh, listening to us and sending questions. In fact, we only have money to get one question. The whole time has not allowed us. Let me give our panelists um, two minutes each so that they can give us their concluding remarks. I'm beginning with Dr. Josem Msenguzi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. First of all, I must say that it has been a great pleasure for me to join this uh, eminent panel, but also to address you as young people the people that are going, are going to be leaders of this country and to again say that as you aspire to be leaders in this country, start with yourselves. And, and I think if you look at yourself, start by being selfish yourself. In order to make a contribution, you need to be healthy, you need to be empowered through education, you need to look at your career path, make sure you get a, a job and get skills and then start taking responsibility for your own life. If you do that, then network, then you look after your family, and you will be a great asset to your own country. So the question of looking at yourself, starting with yourself, is, is very, very important, and I want to appeal to you. The country needs you, just like you need it, but the most important thing is what you decide to do with your, with your life, especially knowing that you can protect yourself from unwanted pregnancies that may lead you to unsafe abortion, that may, may get you out of school and lead you to a path of poverty. So the, the power is within your hands, and I want to encourage you to play your role as a, young, as a responsible young person in Uganda. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Sarah, two minutes. Thank you. Um, it has been a pleasure for me to interact with the young people in this country. 
and as you all know, your health is in your hands. Your future lies squarely with the decisions that you make today. Our interest as government, or our focus as government, is to ensure that we do not see uh, children being born in this country by chance, but children being born by choice. So I want to urge you, the young people, to be the change that we all want to see in the world. Culture has existed, religion has existed, but when the young people are dying as a result of unsafe abortion, when the young people are dying as a result of, obs of obstructed labor, when the young people are losing their lives because they are trying to bring another life on earth, everybody is silent. So let us stop hiding our heads in the sand and trying to pretend hiding under culture, the world has changed. We Thank need to move on. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Your parting shot, Dr. Babatunde. Thank you, moderator. I, I want to throw a challenge to you, and this is something that I do everywhere I go. All of you sitting in this room today are very privileged. You're very privileged because you've been to school, you have education, you know where to go, you have choices. But you represent a larger population of young people who would never have the opportunity of even coming close to Kampala or Entebbe. I want you to commit yourself to reach out to at least five rural young girls, five, each one of you. Pass the information you have today to them. Assist them if they need services. And mentor them so that they can stay in school and they don't get pregnant. If you do that, and they do that in a geometric way, you know you would have solved the problem of teenage pregnancy. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Give them a round of applause. Let, let me... Let me, let me ask by a show of hands, how many are going to reach out to five girls in rural Uganda? Okay, some are, some are not going to do that. <laughs> okay, only one is not going to do that. Thank you very much. You've been such a wonderful audience. Thank you to our global audience for being a part of this. And uh, these are men and women of substance who have spoken to you. You are also girls and boys of substance across Uganda. Thank you very much. And um, we have five minutes of networking after here. You, maybe you can talk to the minister and talk to the executive directors, anything you want. Only five minutes. Uh, for me, here, it's a wrap. Good night and God bless Uganda. Thank you. I've realized that it's all up to us. Um, the fight against HIV, the, the fight against teenage pregnancies is, is up to us as, feel, as young, young people to create a paradigm shift for the rest of uh, the communities that we stay in and uh, make Uganda uh, a developed country. Thank you very much. Well, my message to uh, to UNFPA, my message to the Ugandan government, my message also to uh, uh, to the Minister of Health, most especially, and also to all the mostly also to the Ugandan young people. One thing that I can tell them is that uh, the advocacy for having an effective family planning starts with you. You know, like for me now, as a young father, I know now this whole thing has to begin with me. I already have two children. I'm not thinking of having another one right now. So the message is, and he has actually simplified it by saying, if we can use our phones, you know, the message can transcend, the message can move on. And I believe right now, actually, with, uh, with my organization, Bonfire Uganda, since I am an artist, and you know, artists, we have this habit of, of, uh, of planting kids wherever we do shows. That's one of the advocates that I want to start with at the National Theatre. Build up this whole thing and have artists coming up together and supporting this advocacy. And yes, together we can. And these three days that you're going to be here, I'd like to say thank you so much. Thank you so much to the NTV guys for putting this thing, this whole thing outside there, and I believe we'll do something. Okay. Yeah. Well, what I can tell them is that, uh, you know, they say a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, and if it is that step, then it has to begin now, and it has to begin with you. That's my message, more fire.